Okay, so um, I'm going to start by pointing out, I'm, I'm branding the voting technology project here. And you'll notice that the slides that, and Charles uses these slides too, they do say Caltech MIT. So, you know, we, we do like to think of it that way, but, uh, uh, it, well, that's the way we like to think of it. Uh, but look, I wanted to start off by just saying I'm, I'm very excited to be here, and, and thank you for the invitation. This is a very exciting opportunity, and I, and I think that what you all have accomplished here and what I think the future looks like for this, this program is, is just incredibly exciting. And I'll, I'll tell you that, that I'm just jealous because we don't have one of these at Caltech. Um, and I would very much like to see Caltech do something like this in the future. Uh, this is, again, very exciting, and I think this, this represents what the, the future of not just my little area of the world, which is social science, but, but I think the future of, of, of universities like M MIT and Caltech, which is really to fulfill this interdisciplinary mission by bringing people like me together with statisticians and engineers and operations research people, the kind of thing we've been doing in the funny technology project for some time. So it's very exciting to be here, if I can figure out how to move the slide thing forward that way. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two different things, and I don't have a lot of time, um, and I certainly will be around the, the next couple of days if folks want to chat about, about this or about anything relating to, to social science and how it, it might fit in with, with um, this, this kind of interdisciplinary data science that's ongoing. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about is some of the new opportunities, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that, that Nate already talked about, which is transparency, um, and that these, how we're grappling with both these issues in this kind of new era of computing possibilities and data. Um, some of you, I, some of you who are like me, who have gray hair, probably recognize what those things on the left side of the screen are. I took this picture last week in my office. I, I still have these in my office. I use these for you know, my dissertation work. You know, I worked on my dissertation in the late 80s. Um, in order to do any kind of data science or any st sort of statistics, we had to use mainframe data. We had to use mainframe computers. Uh, it took forever. Data wasn't readily available. Uh, data sets were relatively small. We had to use mainframe computers, so I was, I was running mainframe, uh, like a, I think we worked on some sort of IBM system when I was at Duke, so you had to monk around with this job control language, and then you had to use these proprietary uh, software packages, so we were really constrained in what we could do, okay? And so social science methodology at the time, it was, it was fun, I mean, I've enjoyed doing it my whole career, but there was an incredibly steep learning curve, and we just couldn't do very much, all right? And, and, and that's changed. And, and this, yes, is the book, um, and I wanted to talk just a little bit about it because uh, the reason why I edited this book, and there's a section in the introduction that I wrote called Change is Good, is, is to really talk about how there's a revolution going on in social science, in political science in particular, where what used to be computational social science, some of you know this, this field, it used to be agent-based modeling, um, and that used to be kind of what we used to think of as computational social science. But there's a lot more going on in this domain now than just that, that small kind of, you know, sort of, sort of small research area where people are using all sorts of innovative, interesting new data sets, bringing them together and doing incredibly clever and exciting things with them. Charles talked about voter history files, um, and, and this is just an, an amazing resource of data. Uh, yes, in fact, if you were a registered voter in the US, it's probably the case that we could pretty easily get your record. Um, most of that data is available to academic researchers. So it's, it's an incredible data resource. It's essentially a census of America, at least of registered voters, um, and researchers are starting to use it. It's, it's widely used in the private sector, um, and, and those files can be linked in lots of ways to, to other data sets, either directly through personal identifiers or indirectly through a lot of the statistical methods that people are, are using these days to bridge and link different data sets. We have, and, and Nate talked a little bit about this, we have massive quantities of survey data. And that's partly what enables people like Nate to do the incredibly cool things that they do. But it's also allowing social scientists to do all sorts of, of other incredible things. Some of the data sets we have are very large, like the CCS or the CPS. Lots of them are, very, are small. But we can pool them and bridge them and link them together and do novel things with the survey data that we just couldn't do before. There's all sorts of other innovative data sets, like I, I mentioned here, voter advice applications. These are uh, actually very common in Europe. Uh, we have a number of folks, uh, colleagues in Europe, who run these voter advice applications where people go in and type in their preferences, and, and, and they yield hundreds of thousands of data points per election cycle. People's preference information, it's just incredible data. Social media data, text data, uh, administrative data like the elections data that, that, that we use for the voting technology project. So, Again, there's this vast quantity of information that's available to us as social scientists. It's kind of frustrating because there's so much. 
Um, and the other part of, of this equation is the, the incredible changes in computation. Again, we don't have to use the mainframe computers. My iPhone has more computing power than what I was able to use when I wrote a dissertation. Uh, we have infinite storage, fast computing, and this new kind of culture of open source code and code sharing and data sharing. So, uh, you know, the first part of this is just say, man, it's great to be a social scientist today. I mean, it's really exciting. Charles and I were sitting at dinner last night. We were complaining because there's so many cool things to do. We just don't have time to do them. You know, I kind of wish we could clone ourselves and, you know, clone all of our students because there's just so many opportunities. And I'm happy to talk about all those opportunities at some point because I only have four minutes left. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit and kind of pick up on the theme that, that Nate talked about. So again, what, what makes the kind of work that, that they do uh, possible is all this new data. Um, and what I think is also exciting about what, what Nate and, and others in this area do is they're, they're transparent about it. And so one of the things that we've been working on at the journal that I edit, Political Analysis, is trying to translate those kinds of transparency principles into academic research. And, and that's a, a, something that I think society is demanding of us today. Our funders are demanding it. Our universities demand it. Our colleagues demand it. Um, and I think it's a, it's a very important new theme, especially in social science today for, for a lot of reasons. But what we really need to try to do is to try to make this data and information and code available to, to the public, in particular our colleagues who are going to use it. But, but again, there are a lot of very sophisticated people out in the world today who just are really interested in the things that we do. And so we really do need to figure out ways to make all of this transparent and readily accessible um, today. Uh, and it's, it's a key thing that I think that the providers of data sets also need to grapple with. Um, there's a lot of organizations that collect lots of data. And in many cases, we're, we're sort of stymied at getting access to it, as Charles alluded to earlier. And, and so organizations that are producing data, we need to work with them a little bit to, to get access and, and to get uh, uh, more of their data, in particular our colleagues in the election administration field, which we can talk more about later, how difficult it is oftentimes just to get simple statistics from uh, states and counties as to say how many people turn out to vote or how many people voted in an election. Now, our journal has required that when someone publishes a paper, they're supposed to provide their replication materials. That sounds simple in practice, um, or simple in theory, difficult in practice, of course, as we found out. Um, what we've been doing recently for about the last three years is requiring, again, that a paper, if you make any kind of empirical claim in, in, that we publish, and this is analytics or simulations, which is pretty much everything we publish in our journal, um, they have to provide that information um, so that we can make it available to the public. Uh, and you know, usually this is pretty straightforward you know, for most people who are running any kind of um, models. It's really just a question of documenting what they've done, providing their code, and giving us the data. Um, and I, I can talk more about the details of how we do this, but we do this at the point right before we accept the paper. So we require that they give us this information. Uh, we have a graduate student at Caltech and one at Stanford who goes through it and actually runs it and makes sure it works. The editor who's in charge of that paper does the same thing. So we have a graduate student who runs all this stuff and then the editor who's looking at the paper also checks all this stuff out. And it's only at that moment in time when we fully understand it, that it runs, it reproduces the results in, in the paper, that we will accept the paper for publication. Once we do that, of course, the materials go online. We use the Harvard Dataverse for that. Um, and then we move the paper forward to, to publication. Now, we're a relatively small journal. We are one of the highest impact journals in political science. But we currently have about 300 articles that, that we have all of the replication materials for. This is every single article going back to about 2012. Most of the articles published before that, the materials are available. They're just not in our Dataverse yet. We're working on that. Uh, What's exciting from an author's perspective is that all this stuff is out there. Um, people download it. On average, we think about 80 times. Each, each of these articles gets about 80 downloads. Um, people use it in teaching. Um, and there's some indication. We haven't done a really good controlled randomized study on this yet because we don't want to subject our authors necessarily to that, uh, that, uh, that by producing these materials and providing them to the public, it does appear that people are more likely to read and cite your paper. So we think it's good, good for our authors. Uh, I've just got a few seconds, but, but even though sort of in theory this sounds good, in practice it's really tough. And we've been having a lot of trouble um, not only doing it ourselves, but also getting some of our fellow journals to do it as well. Interesting, people have trouble documenting their data. Um, lots of the code we get doesn't work. Um, lots of code has errors in it, surprisingly enough. 
Uh, and, and a lot of times the data actually requires information that we're not comfortable making to, available to the public, in particular personally identifying information. So a lot of these replication uh, packages take time for us to deal with, and it slows our process down, but we think it's really important for the profession, and we think it adds a lot of value to the papers we publish. So really quickly, there's a lot of additional problems that, that we're looking at, but the biggest one with this area of research transparency is just convincing other journals to do this. All right, Our journal is unique. Uh, there's maybe, I think, two or three other journals in political science that do exactly what we do. There's a lot of other journals that have agreed to this in, in, in principle, um, and we really need to move the social sciences further down this direction because, quite frankly, transparency and accessibility is a good thing for the journals, it's a good thing for the, uh, the profession, and it's a good thing for authors. So I'll stop there. Um, thank you and excited to be here. <laughs>